Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. This program is sponsored in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support the arts and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Scott Laborde and welcome to Steppin' Out. Happy New Year! We have updates from the local restaurant, arts, and entertainment scenes and joining me, Poppy Tooker, host <laughs> of Louisiana Eats on WWNO Radio. Hey Poppy, good Hi, to Peg. see you. Hello. Doug McCash is with us and of course he covers the arts and culture scenes for the Times Speaking Union, New Orleans Advocate. Hello Mr. <laughs> Doug. Hi. Happy New Year. Yeah, absolutely. And Alfred Richard, movie critic for WWNO WWL TV. Hello, Alfred. Happy New Hi. Year. That hangover is strong. <laughs> <laughs> and Alan Smason of theatercriticism.com and the Crescent City Jewish News. Hi. Happy New Year. And Ian McNulty will return next week. Poppy, almost, it's almost, almost king cake time, isn't it? Woohoo! Oh, it's so close. I can almost taste it. And we're going to have kind of an odd carnival, but we can all console ourselves with king cake. Lots and lots of king cake, and that's what you're going to find at the King Cake Hub. Now, this year, the King Cake Hub has a new location. It's going to be at the Broad Theater, so that means there's going to be plenty of parking, a huge retail space. It's going to be going every day from January 6th, 8 a.m. until 6 p.m., and there will still be that carnival kickoff on January 6th between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., Benny Grunch and the Bunch, Professor Carnival, and lots of new King Cake partners Will Samuels has come in with this year. Of course, there's all our old favorites like Gambino's, Bywater Bakery, Kaluta's King Cake, of course. I don't... I, tons of different king cakes, but the, ca the, the cake cafe king cake, okay, that everybody loves so much, goat cheese and apple, and um, new this year, Steve Himmelfarb is making a cafe au lait king cake. So even though there's no cake cafe, there's king cake hub with every kind of king cake you can imagine. You can order online for same day pickup and DoorDash delivery straight from the website, and also, 24-7, it is Mardi Gras time on MardiGrasTV.com, another offshoot of the King Cake Hub. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, Gracious Bakery will have someone coming up Gracious too. Gracious, huh? yeah. New from Gracious Bakery. You know, it's such a hassle to try to ship a king cake out of town. And Megan Foreman has developed a perfect mix, a king cake kit. And of course, her almond queen cake and chocolate king cake will also be available at the King Cake Hub along with these kits. You're going to find this at all the Gracious Bakery stores. It's going to be at Flirty Girl. It's going to be all over town. Whole Foods going to have them. So a great way to send some Mardi Gras fun out of town. Thank you so much, Poppy. And uh, moving over to Alfred. Alfred, do give us a, a status report of local theaters, movie theaters, that is. Well, as we now kick off into 2021, it's hard to believe we could actually say it's 2021. <laughs> uh, we have some survivors, I can say. And the biggest survivor in my mind is the little theater on Britannia that could and did. The Britannia Theater, of course, like other theaters, was hit hard as an epidemic started in 2020, and they closed for a bit. Then they reopened with social distancing, and they survived. They not only did, I guess you could say, repertory film, but they also did first-run films as well, and they also thrived to the point that we can now say there's the Britannia Uptown and the Britannia Theater at Canal Place. That opened in late 2020, one of the good things that happened toward the end of 2020. The Britannia took over the eight theaters of Cinnabar at Canal Place. They now have eight more screens for films there. So 
the Britannia Uptown and the Britannia Canal Place are true survivors of this time as we head into 2021. Another very good survivor is the Broad Theater. Now, it too had to close for a short time, but the Broad reopened and, again, social distanced. Everyone has to wear the mask, as I've always mentioned. But one of the great things about the Broad is that they were able to branch out into something new, and I'm sure it's going to be part of what Poppy was talking about earlier, the Broadside at the Broad Theater, an outdoor emporium where you can watch movies later in the day. You can also, there's also been concerts and other performances there. So the Broadside at the Broad Theater is a great addition. It's near the Greenway. And so that film theater and that segment is open there. And those are the theaters that opened again. Now, reopened theaters, we know now there's the big ones, and those are the AMC theaters, the Clearview, the Elmwood, West Bank, and Hammond. They have reopened in the region, although there are some murmurings about whether or not they will have enough films in 2021 for AMC to remain viable in the coming year. We shall see. Also, the little theater just across from Araby, and that is the Zeitgeist Theater and Lounge in Araby. It kind of reminds you of movie pictures many years ago in the Mid-City area. You also have Movie Tavern for those who are in Covington on the North Shore, and the Grand Theaters in Slidell, they have reopened at this time. Unfortunately, I would say that we start 2021 with some theaters that still remain closed. As of now, the Chalmette Movies has not reopened. However, Ellis Marcel, Ellis Fortenberry, I was about to say the great musician, Ellis Fortenberry, the owner of the Chalmette Movies, said that he will probably reopen later this year. So the beginning of this year, we're hoping to see Chalmette reopen. The Regal Covington and the Grand Esplanade and GFX in Kenner have yet to reopen at this time. So it's a mixed bag, but a majority of theaters are starting, have and have opened in the region. All right, thank you so much, Alfred. And moving over to Doug. Doug, what a year in so, so many ways, but especially <laughs> the visual arts. Yeah, um, not many silver linings to find in uh, 2020, of course, but one may be the absolute triumph of, uh, of street art at the beginning of the contagion. When there wasn't anything to do and people were quarantined, one of the first things you saw pop up was, uh, was chalk art on the street. It was a way to pass the time, but it was also, a, it was also an expression, an expression of our solidarity. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, the Orleans Chalk Girls' work. I was never 100% sure. Um, <laughs> I think one of the big triumphs of the uh, of the early uh, period during uh, COVID was uh, Josh Wingarder, and Josh Wingarder is a wonderful artist whose work combines uh, sort of a pop art sensibility with a graffiti sensibility. And this was one of the great early icons. Look at the blue gloves and the uh, mask over Louis Armstrong's horn. It was great advocacy um, and also a lot of fun. Uh, as you remember, uh, Frenchman Street was all boarded up at the time, and uh, Josh Wingarder made it his own uh, art gallery with, um, oh gosh, 30, 40 uh, paintings like that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful stuff. Um, followed by Lionel Milton, who uh, very poetically combined um, social consciousness from that era with the COVID um, uh, situation. It was brilliant. Uh, uh, his murals were brilliant on Frenchman Street. Um, Dr. Bob, who, uh, who we know um, from his um, Be Nice or Leave sign, joined the street art uh, you know, community with a Be Mast or Leave sign. Uh, once again, uh, uh, artist turning advocate uh, during the period. And then, um, then where advocacy left off, we needed distraction. And this was the reality breaker, a, uh, a rolling puppet show that was just uh, marvelous. And, I, and I'm so happy and, and, and pleased that, you know, the art community stepped up to uh, provide the sort of uh, distraction we needed. It was free, it was accessible, it was visible, it was safe. And uh, these were our boosters uh, during the quarantine, and I want to thank them for that. Doug, we need things to make them make us smile, and that really did, we coming do. down the street. Well, yeah, okay. that was a laugh. That was a good thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. And on to Alan, looking back at 2020. Whew. What a year. Well, you know, we started off, uh, and I'm going to basically take this uh, sort of like an onstage 
kind of approach because when we started off the year, we had some really exciting news. First off, uh, the World War II Museum was up and running at BB Stage Door Canteen. I, I had an occasion to see Spencer Rocca and his Elvis impersonation over, over there. They did a wonderful job, and things looked really great. Uh, they had another show that they were doing with the Victory Bells, uh, and we saw, of course, uh, not that long after that, Southern Rep had the uh, Mother Courage cast that we had, that we see here, that they, they did a performance of Bertolt Brecht's Mother Courage that had been done with uh, Entozaki Shange's uh, translation uh, and uh, uh, discovered by uh, M.A. Hayes, uh, a wonderful show. Uh, and we took that and moved into Le Petit stage and saw the piano lesson, August Wilson's play, and then all of a sudden, pandemic. Everything set in at that point. All the theaters were closed. Where do we go for our entertainment? People started to try to figure out what we could do. Of course, one of the big items that came out uh, during the summer was we got to see Hamilton finally. Uh, they sped up the production uh, was supposed to come out uh, a year later. It actually came out this summer in uh, July, right before uh, Independence Day, which was fantastic. So those of us who did not get a chance to see it uh, got a chance to, to uh, see it again on uh, Disney Plus. And, and again, it was worth $75 million to Disney to do that. Then what do we do? Uh, a lot of people started to do the pandemic pivot. They had uh, Le Petit uh, and and uh, the NOLA project started to do both the radio plays and the pod plays that they had. Uh, Rivertown, of course, started to do some comedy shows, as did JPAS. They did some one-man comedy shows, socially distanced, etc. And, of course, one of the great people who uh, went to Rivertown, Ricky Graham. How can you not love Ricky? He, he's always producing wonderful work. And, of course, uh, the Meemaw Mysteries, uh, the latest things he's done, he had something he did with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rivertown that... that uh, we also will remember Barley Jean Merman. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was amazing that he was able to do some of that stuff. And then, of course, um, you know, we, we lost the entire season for, for uh, Summer Lyric, but, but JPS stepped up. I got a chance to see Doug Toro and his American Soldier production, and the first time I got a chance to sit myself in a seat in a theater and really experience a theatrical piece, and I was so happy to see that. So, so we did have some good high points, even though it was post-pandemic, and we had to kind of regroup and try to figure out where to go to from there. Now, as far as loss, Amy Hayes had to resign basically uh, through the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, she tried to keep on as long as she could, but they're going to go in a different direction now. Uh, she is uh, going to be still helping them, but uh, she uh, is no longer the uh, producing artistic director at Southern Rep. Uh, and, of course, uh, we had some real legitimate loss, people who will no longer be with us on stage. Sherry Marina there with uh, Brian Sands we saw, and, of course, uh, our beloved Carol Sutton. Uh, those of us who, who knew and loved her, uh, you know, just were so sorry to see her go. What a, what a, a, a huge loss for us. And this was from her funeral. We, we had uh, pins that were distributed uh, again, and I was very uh, pleased that they uh, had given me one. But, but again, uh, we will miss her. Uh, only the second time that someone has been laid uh, in state, uh, lying in state uh, at uh, Gallia Hall. What a true honor uh, for her. Ty Tracy was the first, of course. Yeah, we sure will miss her. She's such a wonderful lady, too. She's so nice, she's so sweet and nice and so talented. So many things. Great. Thank you very much, Alan. And back over to Poppy. And we actually have some good news about an expansion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's some exciting things coming this year. And... For anybody who loves those tacos at Barracuda, they have just done such a great job. Their food's delicious. They've been really successful at their place on Chapatula, successful enough to expand to Algiers. So they're moving over there, second location with their tacos and bowls and, of course, their margaritas. And another thing I'm so excited about because, oh, this is 15-plus years in the making, Vaucresson Sausage is coming back to the Seventh Ward um, in this upcoming year. Vance Vaucresson got some new partners, and uh, that includes Dook the Fourth, who is Leah's grandson. He's a partner, even though I have to say Vaucresson Sausage has always been the secret ingredient in Leah's gumbo. And bravo to Leah's grands, that's what she always called them, the grandchildren who have been ushering in the future at Dookie Chase Restaurant during this past year, including Eve Haydell, who's the mixologist in residence at what used to be Mr. Dookie's Bar. And then there's the losses and little dizzies. Oh, my gosh. I don't know how we will ever 
see a replacement for that. We won't, in fact. Um, gosh, hopefully, maybe we'll see some little dizzies at Jazz Fest, if there is one. K. Paul's, that was a terrible loss that made big news nationwide. And then, of course, our dear friend, Julia Reed. It was such a tragic thing when Julia passed away this fall. At the young age of 59, we'll all miss her. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And moving over to Alfred, um, there's activity. Uh, movies and TV uh, uh, shows are being made in New Orleans, thank goodness now. After a long break because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and let's not forget, it's still ongoing at this point. But one of the things is that Hollywood South had to take a forced long break, and some things are slowly coming back. First of all, the one film that's come in, I haven't gotten a lot of information about it, is a film called Zoic, Z-O-I-C. Now, it was in production back in November. It started actually around November 23rd, and it's going to keep going on until the 24th of this month. So it's going to be a short turnaround for this film. But some films and TV shows that we know of and have loved over the last couple of years will still continue. First of all, Queen Sugar. Mm -hmm. Queen Sugar is now going into season five. And of course, we mentioned, you mentioned earlier about Carol Sutton's loss. She was a member of the crew and an actress on that series, unfortunately passing through COVID-19. But this one stars Rutina Wesley and Kobe Sirabu, and it's going to keep going. It started on December 18th and will be filming through the first part of this year. So Queen Sugar will continue going on. Nisi Nash, you may remember her, of course, from Reno 911, but more recently from Claws. Claws season four has just concluded its filming. And it's supposed to be in its final season, but if the success is such, you might see Nisi as in charge of that nail salon and the criminal element once more for a possible next season. But right now, it has wrapped up for this season four, and they're waiting to see if season five will be a possibility. A series called Leverage 2.0, now back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, TNT had a series called Leverage. Well, they're bringing it back for a reboot, and this time starring Aldous, Hod Aldous Hodge and Nola Wiley. Now, Nola Wiley, of course, is known to people from the magicians and another series over the years, but it's filming Drew February 2021, and we're going to see one other person, and that's a series from NCIS New Orleans. And Scott Bakula, uh, of course, he is pride, and he is a pride, a full person in New Orleans on NCIS New Orleans, entering season seven, hard to believe is true. And one of the other people involved with that lovely lady, CCH Pounder, who plays the coroner on the series, is back for season seven. Now, all of these series have massive COVID-19 protocols. People have to go through the testing. And no longer do you have groups of people constantly sitting with each other. I remember as being a person who had been an actor on some of these characters and some of these shows. So again, you have to wear the mask, and there will be testing. Oh, one final note as well. A series that are your honor apparently is a short mini-series has wrapped up, and they, too, are waiting to see if Brian Cranston will be back for season two. All right. Thank you so much. I remember when he made Trumbo here a few years ago. He must like New Orleans. <laughs> he likes New Orleans. Hey, he was royalty. That's right. That's right. He was. <laughs> Speaking of royalty, as we anticipate Carnival, Doug, uh, already some different takes on it. It's true. Peggy, my first uh, my first carnival, my first Mardi Gras was 1979, the, oh. uh, the police strike. And, uh, and so after 42 years, we're faced with sort of the same thing. There are going to be no conventional large-scale parades. Um, but what will Carnival look like? What will Mardi Gras 2021 look like? Well, some of the smaller marching clubs and other organizations are, um, are performing experiments that give us some clues of what we might be seeing. For instance, uh, the crew to Mayuel, which is a, a, a crew that blends um, Mexican Day of the Dead traditions with New Orleans second-line traditions, 
they experimented with doing an impromptu parade, a parade that they did not announce publicly that walks through the St. Rock neighborhood, and their strategy was, by not announcing it, um, they could stay social distanced and not draw a crowd. That's the sort of, uh, that's the sort of strategy that, um, that we're seeing pop up. Um, the crew of House Floats, uh, which is a, uh, an organization that is uh, encouraging people to, uh, to um, use their front porch as though it was a Mardi Gras float, well, they're doing a, 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 a map so that you could travel around the city and find these, uh, find these artistic creations on people's porches. They may even throw things. They have their own medallion, um, which they may throw. Um, another experiment was the crew of Krampus. And the crew of Krampus is a, a, a sort of Christmas tradition in Europe where there's a, an anti-Santa Claus. And what, uh, what the crew of Krampus did was they, um, they staged a stationary parade, for lack of a better word, where you drove past what would have been a parade. And uh, they performed outside of car windows, which all seemed you know, very safe and, uh, and, and well thought out. Um, you see other things. Um, at, at the uh, 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 Jewish Community Center, they did a party called Donuts and Dreidels on Hanukkah, <laughs> where uh, once again you drove through, and it's it's a strategy whereby you can lay eyes on one another, you can smile and laugh, you can eat a donut in this case, but you don't have to be exposed. You can still do so very safely, and I think these strategies are what we may see. Um, in the upcoming season. We, we, we may see nothing at all. Um, lastly, the crew of Red Beans uh, has um, begun raising money to uh, hire Mardi Gras artists who would be working on floats, uh, ha you know, if there were going to be parades, to decorate houses. This is conducted as a, um, a fundraiser and a lottery. If you contribute to the front fundraiser, the crew of Red Beans fundraiser, then you might be chosen to have your house decorated. And, uh, and that's another thing that we're going to see. And I have a question for you. When, when you, you know, what we may be seeing is out of this crisis some new customs. And, um, and ask yourself mm -hmm. this. If, if you have a spectacular house decoration, even if it's some, something you did or something you hired professional artists to do this year, and people toured around and saw them, will you do that next year? Will you do that in 2022? Or will you lay that aside? I think you'll continue. So I think we may be seeing the, um, the groundwork for some new customs uh, to come out. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. You can't go back on some of the stuff, you know. <laughs> and they're great ideas anyway. And, um, you know, God bless Megan Boudreau and absolutely. Devin DeWolf and all of them who are trying to, you know, employ, uh, of course, these talented artists. Thank you so absolutely. much, Doug. Absolutely. All okay. hail our artists. All hail our artists. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. And over to Alan. What a year in theater. And well, you, you were certainly part of it, keeping the drive alive with your own show. Well, Facebook you know, show. basically I figured I, if I didn't do something, Thing, I'd be moving backwards so uh, after the pandemic set in you know I started to uh, organize but you know uh, it wasn't just me there are a lot of people who were involved you know in, in terms of, of putting on productions the first person I reached out to was Joyce Pulitzer who uh, had a wonderful show back in 1999 2000 called Cherry's Jubilee that she wrote with Marcy Nathan and Harriet Nelson uh, and the late Lynn Goldman uh, and we got a chance to put that back on and we had a wonderful cast uh, that uh, did that then uh, we uh, took that and then I appealed to Rosary O'Neill can we get something on and she came up with uh, Marilyn God which of course uh, was with Allison Logan and Rob Pavlovich uh, and and of course Rob was the voice of Clark Gable in Rosary's next production that we did of Clark and Carol uh, and and uh, uh, again a, a wonderful uh, job there uh, I, I just can't tell you how, how good that show was um, then I appealed to John Biganay, the, the wonderful award-winning playwright uh, who, of course, uh, teaches at Loyola as well. John consented to get Gregory Johnson to be the director, and he put on all three of his Rising Water plays, of course, which were Rising Water, 
uh, Leslie Casté there, uh, and, and again, uh, Carl. We had a wonderful time. Uh, Shotgun, which, of course, uh, sort of is taking place, uh, uh, let's say, around five months or so after uh, uh, Katrina. Uh, and, and then Mold, which is about a year after uh, Katrina happened. Um, and so we had all of those wonderful actors. There's Jesse uh, and Nick Thompson there, Greg Johnson, uh, uh, Troy Bechet. Just a, a, a lovely cast. And, of course, uh, uh, after that, we also, uh, you know, had talked about getting some other people on Katrina's Path. These are, are played by some of the original characters, uh, Rudy Rasmussen there, Sidney Smith. Um, they all actually uh, had done their own roles in this particular play that, that Rob Florence had done called Katrina's Path. Um, John Broder added on uh, something for the production of Brick where he actually uh, wasn't able to produce this, he was able to put it on the internet. Uh, and so we were happy to see that. But I think my most pleasing process that I went through was with Nita and Zeta, which I had seen back around 1999, 2000, the original that um, uh, Kathy Randalls had been involved okay, with, yeah. Katie Pearl, uh -huh. they won an OB, Lisa Dale Moore had helped write that, and she directed this piece, wonderful. Also, Amy Rubin later on did Interstate 81, a world premiere, and another world premiere, Simpson since Pride, done by Stephen Maitland Lewis, and we had a, a great cast there talking about uh, the British royals, etc. So, so there was a lot going on. All and, right. And dear. in the real mm -hmm. world, also, just a real quick mention: uh, Black and Blue, uh, another piece about Yvonne Pichet, we we we'd done, and Doll's House was one of the pieces that had been done by the Crescent City Stage, a group of actors who are from Equity, who are down here doing these uh, these things on the internet All as right. well. We've got to do some quick picks, uh, Poppy. Mm -hmm. Just make a resolution to support your local food system this year. Okay. The chefs, the farmers, the fishers, they need our help more than ever. All right, Alfred. My pick, very simply, I hope that the Hollywood South continues to grow as more people get the vaccine and we keep okay. going forward. Doug. Check out Muffin and Jamie Bernstein's uh, um, live ongoing COVID awareness videos. Mm -hmm. They're approaching the 300th consecutive episode. All right, okay, Alan. Mm -hmm. Real quick, Alex Brightman is the guest on Seth Rudesky's concert series. Here he is with me. Uh, he's a crazy, crazy guy. One of the funniest guys on Broadway. Okay, uh, thank you all so very much. And don't forget that concert series too, of course. Thank you all. Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. This program is sponsored in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support the arts and culture in the greater New Orleans area.